You know, I've been real fortunate to have played music with some really great musicians. And I've learned a lot from these musicians and those musical situations about drumming, music, and life. And I'd like to share some insights with you about drumming. And I think the best thing that I can do with my drumming is to try to make the music feel as good as possible. And I do this through my timekeeping. Now, most of the timekeeping that I do happens to be in 4-4 four, four time. 4-4 four, four means that there are four quarter notes to each bar. And I believe that the quarter note is the primary pulse in Western music and, and most contemporary music. So let's pick a tempo. Those are the quarter notes. And let me show you how the subdivisions really define the feel and the style of, of all the different kinds of music that uh, we can play on the drums or that I certainly find myself in the situation to play. So, playing a swung eighth note or triplet subdivision, we have something that sounds like this. One, a two, one, two, three. Okay, now if we play a more straight eighth note uh, combined with sixteenth note sort of subdivision, we have something that feels like this. One, two, three. Another kind of subdivision feel uh, would be found in samba. This is a music that's felt in two, but check out this subdivision. One, two, one. So it's the subdivisions that not only define the music, but really bring the music to life. And of course, the way we play those subdivisions with accents, with dynamics, with phrasing and feeling, uh, make music what it is. You know, music's not just notes on paper. Music is, is, is about life and, and it's, it has to breathe. It has to feel good. It has to be solid and yet be open. Allow room for creativity. We have a great chance to be creative here. And I think the real key to all of this is being able to play a simple beat really well, whether it be jazz, funk, samba, whatever. So let's step by step go through some of these simple kind of beats and analyze what it is that makes a beat uh, successful. Okay. With my philosophy being that the quarter note pulse is the primary part of the beat, I should be able to play four quarter notes to the bar on the ride cymbal and have it feel like something. Okay? Now, the drums are certainly the kind of instrument that you get out of them what you put into them. If you play with snap and with some kind of energy, that energy will be translated to the rest of the musicians as well as the audience. So I want to be able to play four consistent quarter notes on the ride cymbal for each bar and get that happening. Okay, that's the concept. The technique, well, perhaps I should show you uh, my stick grip and, and my relationship to the drum set so you can see how I do this. Now I play with both grips, both meaning traditional, right hand like this, the left hand holding the stick like this, or the matched. I think that the drum set was originally designed around the uh, traditional grip uh, style of drumming. Uh, match grip makes a lot of sense. It's nothing really new. Gene Krupa used to do it years ago. Uh, but I, uh, I, I will switch over to match grip generally when I want a little bit more volume. But I feel most comfortable playing this way. I have my arms down by my side, my shoulders, also are down. 
I try to play as relaxed as I can. This is my snare drum grip. When I play the ride cymbal with my right hand, I turn my hand so that my thumb is on top of the stick. Or actually, it's, it's really behind the stick. It's the driving force behind the stick. I do this for two reasons. One is to give me a better snap, a better drive into the cymbal. And the second reason is if I, if I hold the stick otherwise, I introduce a twist into my arm. And I think it's a good idea to try to keep as straight a line as possible between myself, the tip of the stick, and the instrument. So I play the snare drum like this, ride cymbal like this. Okay. Now, an important part of my approach to drumming is to uh, uh, not only play relaxed, but to play consistently. And consistency starts with your drum stroke. Now, I try to maintain a consistent rebound of about one inch off of any part of the drum kit that I happen to strike. On the snare drum. Tom-toms. hi-hat and of course the ride symbol this does a couple of things as well it ensures that I start each stroke from the same place and I'm keeping my sticks you know in the general area where they're going to be doing their business now, playing the ride cymbal like this would look pretty silly. Or for that matter, the snare drum. It's a great waste of energy and it's a great waste of time. For the stick to travel that far is going to take up time. Uh, whether we're talking milliseconds or, or what, you get the inspiration here when I get the stick down there and it's, it's not where it should be, then you're going to run into some time problems. I call it air drumming. And I, you know, I tell all my students, try to avoid air drumming. It's really not a good idea. Okay, so, quarter note pulse on the ride cymbal. I'm going to pick up the tempo a little bit. Now, to work on cymbal phrasing, how to play this quarter note pulse, Think of what the bass player does. I'm talking about 4-4, four, four, mainstream jazz, kind of a bebop approach. That's, that's how I've approached all music that I played. It was the first music I really listened to. So thinking of what the bass player does, better than that, let's have Mark Johnson demonstrate uh, how he plays four quarter notes to the bar. So the way Mark is playing is that every quarter note is as important as the next one. In other words, he's not accenting beats one and three or beats two and four, but it's a driving quarter note pulse. I try to get the same quality on the ride cymbal. And a one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Now, all drumming is a combination of finger, wrist, and arm motion. It's something my teacher taught me many years ago, and so I've approached it that way. I've never really spent a whole lot of time dedicated to just finger technique. Uh, it, it, it seems a very down-to-earth kind of approach, and uh, 
for me it seems to have worked uh, well. So I'm using elements of all three parts of, of my anatomy, the fingers, the wrist, and the arm. I start each stroke from the same place, getting a, getting some, some like meat and potatoes of the arm in there to get the sound out. Think of gravity, get the stick in there. Bring it up to tempo, sounds like this. One, two, one, two, three. Okay, now remember, play with intensity. You get out of the symbol what you put into it play on top of it, it's not going to really move anybody to, 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 to really swing. So create that energy, create that flow, that continuum of those quarter notes. You're starting to weave the golden thread into the music. This is your timekeeping, okay? It's, it's everything. It's everything for, for, for drumming. Now, it's the, the subdivision again that really defines what this music sounds like, and certainly in, in, in jazz music, it's the drummer's ride cymbal pattern that becomes his signature. So let me play you my signature now. One, two, one, two, three. One. couple things to point out. One is that the uh, quarter note is, uh, is, is plain and easy to hear. The quarter note pulse stays the same. The arm motion playing the quarter note stays the same. And I'm relaxed, my shoulders are down. Elbows are loose, nothing tight. You know, I, it, it's funny with a lot of my students. I, I can I can look at them play just for a few seconds, and and I can kind of tell what it's going to sound like. Uh, you watch anybody do something well; it, it seems very natural, second nature, uh, for them to do it. Whether it's a ball player hitting a home run or a drummer playing the drums, it's, it, you should have that kind of uh, rapport and that kind of uh, friendship with your instrument, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's not unnatural, and it doesn't seem like you're breaking your neck, because that certainly isn't going to provide much of a groove for anything. So, here again is some 4-4 four -four jazz time playing on the ride cymbal. One, two, one, two, three, four. A lot of times, students will ask me, what do you practice? That's what I practice. That's what I started practicing quite a few years ago. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I learned how to play the jazz ride cymbal pattern, and I uh, went ding, ding, a ding, ding, a ding, and it seemed like, okay, that was good, and I got more interested in what, what I could do with my left hand or with my bass drum, whatever. Uh, I was on automatic, and a bad automatic. I didn't really understand, I didn't have an, uh, an inside knowledge of what it felt like to swing. So that when I started listening back to recordings of myself, I realized this doesn't swing. What's happening? It's not happening in the ride cymbal. So I went back to basics and tried to get myself to play simply and to play well. 
And by really covering that ground, I opened the door to a lot more possibilities. One thing that's really been important to me is to understand how the quarter note pulse works, specifically with ride cymbal playing. Now you can phrase the ride cymbal pattern any way that you hear it. Uh, you know, accenting beats two and four, or the and of two and the and of four. But the drummers that I listen to, specifically someone like Philly Joe Jones, I could always hear the clarity of that quarter note pulse and the consistency that came from studying and playing the ride cymbal that way. Uh, r I really feel that it, that it gave me a very strong base and foundation from which to open up and, and play any kind of pattern that I feel. Now, the drummers that learn to play the ride cymbal pattern accenting on beats two and four, the problem that, that I have with that, and I think that they have, is that they kind of go on automatic with it, and they learn to play this pattern as a, th as a series of three-note phrases. So you have something like this. They might even traverse across the symbol with a circular motion. And uh, at all sorts of tempos, these drummers might be relying on more bounce instead of working the beat and really controlling how the, how the thing is swinging. Uh, a bonafide quarter note pulse, this clarity, I think, really carries the music. This three-note phrase really doesn't do it for me, and it really manifests itself uh, in, in brighter tempos where the drummer wants to start dancing around with the cymbal beat, you know, making variations. You get something like this. As opposed to this. A lot more clarity there. And clarity, you know, that's what it's all about. The other musicians are listening to you. They're listening to your ride cymbal. Why is the ride cymbal the lead voice on the drum set? Well, it's because it's always playing the subdivisions. It becomes the primary reference point for yourself, everything you're going to do, certainly the other musicians you're playing with, and your audience as well. So clarity is really important. And I think once you master this quarter note pulse, and get that feeling good, then certainly phrase it any way you hear it. As I've said with some other examples, once you learn something and you internalize that knowledge, then it's there. Whether you play it or not, that time pulse, that time feeling is there. That feeling that makes the music feel good. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
We all have peculiar muscle habits, where when the right hand does something, the left hand will respond in kind, and that's why independence exercises uh, were created to help us smooth out those kinds of problems. Uh, while emphasizing the ride symbol and the importance of swinging, let me play you a series of rhythms that are on or off the beat, and hear how the ride symbol pattern stays consistent the feeling stays the same, and the left hand can start playing different kinds of rhythms without interfering with the groove. One, two, one, two, three, four. Everything that I played on the snare drum fit in perfectly well with the ride cymbal pattern, and nothing that I played interfered with the groove or the actual pattern. That discipline is important. Once you have mastered that, then I think you can freely go on to breaking it up. In other words, be the master of your own destiny. You want to you be in control of what you're going to play. Now I'd like to do some other kinds of rhythms on the bass drum, the hi-hat, and more on the snare drum, incorporating the rest of the drum kit here uh, while keeping the ride cymbal pattern going and keeping the groove happening. And one, two, one, two, three, four.
everything that I'm playing on the snare drum, the bass drum, the hi-hat, on the rest of the kit, it all has to contribute to the forward motion of the music. Just like a piano player or a guitar player comps, we do the same thing. We're comping on the instrument, on the snare drum, those rhythms that we play. Uh, the word comp comes from accompaniment. And I think it's a good idea to be pretty specific when you play these rhythms. Something my dad taught me was to say what you mean and mean what you say. And you really don't want to be marking the passage of time by doing what I call a lot of doggy paddling on the snare drum, a kind of nervous. Be specific, play what you mean to play. Now, when I do play on the snare drum, I hope you've noticed that I use what I consider an appropriate amount of arm motion to play tap tap. doesn't require too much arm motion or energy and, and I see no reason to move the entire arm to play lightly on the snare drum. Now, foot technique, uh, the common question is do you play with your heel up or your heel down? I do both on both pedals and, and for good reason. Now, I think if you have your feet flat on the ground or flat on the pedals, you have better balance and better control. And so you should be able to play that way. And certainly when you have to play soft, it's much easier. Now, the reason why is this. When you play loud, you want to get all the strength and that, uh, the full weight of your legs. There's a lot of, uh, lot of meat and bone there. And you can take advantage of that to really, uh, uh, really clobber the bass drum if you have to. If you want to play softly, then there's no reason that you should have to tiptoe or support all the weight of your leg to bring it down quietly. Same with the hi-hat. It's much easier to have your feet flat on the pedal. So for control, and for softer volume playing, I like to have my feet flat on the pedals. For higher volume situations, I like to go up into the ball of my foot. Uh, when it comes to jazz 4-4 playing, uh, ever since I've been young, I've always played with my heel up and it looks like this. If you play heel toe, be very careful not to do something like this. Your foot tapping on beats one and three, it sounds like you're playing a two beat. And uh, I think in most kind of four, four music you're gonna be playing, you don't want that. So if you have a noisy left heel, be careful for that. Uh, the other time I go up into the ball of my foot on the bass drum pedal is for multiple strokes. So I think both techniques are viable. Uh, do what feels best, do what's natural, do your thing. One, a two, one, two, three.
it's very important to practice anything you do at a lot of different tempos. We all have that same medium groove that, that we enjoy practicing things at, and we can make beats sound good. But we need to be able to play comfortably and well, slow and fast. So be sure to vary your practice tempos, because that certainly is, is what's going to happen on the gig. Now, I think to play tempos, particularly slow tempos, you have to have a lot of trust and faith in yourself that what you're playing works. The simple beat that you're playing is enough. You're, you're really setting the music up for greater things to come. And those spaces between the notes, they're some of the most important notes that you can play or not play. So by allowing the music to breathe and giving it the right amount of space in motion, uh, then I think you, you can make it uh, feel really good. And I'll try to demonstrate that with some slower jazz tempos. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Get slower. One, two, one, two, three. Let's get slower. One, two, three. Playing slow should be a piece of cake. It gives a lot of younger drummers problems uh, because I think they, they get nervous about all that open space. Uh, but it, it's really a, a very simple thing to do. I sing the subdivisions to myself. Now, I don't consciously count out subdivisions like one triplet, two triplet, or one eanda, two eanda. Uh, but for example, like in a medium jazz tempo, I'm singing to myself the swung eighth note subdivision. One, two, three, four, dee, dee, pa, boop, dee, pa, bee, dee, bee, dee, pa, ah, ah, za, za, da, da, pa, ah, 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 cha, da, da, boom, pa, 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 da. So, the slower kind of tempo, same, same sort of thing. One, two, three. Now, after a while, this becomes uh, really kind of a subconscious sort of thing. You don't have to consciously sing subdivisions to yourself. It's knowledge that becomes a part of you. You internalize this. This becomes about purely by experience, by doing it enough so that as soon as you start that tempo, you know where it is. Practicing or working with a click track, metronome, uh, any kind of a clock, really helps to reinforce and strengthen this ability, but it really just comes from the doing. Now, we'd like to play something that's real slow. Sometimes we uh, abuse the privilege and play it like unbelievably slow, but we'll, we'll, we'll do this moderately slow. Uh, it's a composition called Sweet Soul, and uh, I hope you enjoy and appreciate the amount of space that we leave between the beats uh, and that it will feel as good to you as it does uh, to us.
By contrast, fast tempos require a bit more work, but really no less concentration. Interestingly, when I have to play fast, I try to think slow. In other words, I'm not counting to myself, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I want to try to see the forest for the trees and get the big picture. So I feel the music uh, with different layers or levels of time. In other words, if we have a tempo, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, I might be counting it one, two, ding, 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 three, ding, 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 four, ding, 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 one, two, three, or even uh, even uh, larger and slower counts. One, two. So I can breathe more. I'm not thinking in such small crowded units. The phrasing of the ride symbol changes a little bit. Uh, we have less room in the bar to really uh, open up those swung eighth notes or triplets, so they become slightly straighter. I will start with a medium tempo and gradually increase the speed up to a fairly fast tempo. You gotta play fast. One, you wanna really be relaxed, and two, feel free to start changing up the ride cymbal pattern. These little bit of breaks here and there, playing a quarter note, reversing the pattern, really gives you some breathing room and it lets your arm rest just enough uh, you can break it up so, uh, you know, that uh, you, you physically get real tense or tired. Because if you get tired or get tense trying to play fast, then you're just choking, uh, choking the music. Now, with the trio, we'd like to play something kind of up. And uh, notice that even though there's a lot of note activity going on, we're still trying to get the music to breathe.
We may use the brushes in a variety of musical situations, and we need not limit ourselves to playing the brushes just on ballads or behind the bass solo. But I think the ballad is certainly an appropriate place to look at how to play the brushes, and it'll give me a, a nice uh, setting with which to demonstrate basic brush technique. Now, I'm self-taught on the brushes. The way I learned to play was by using the left hand brush in a counterclockwise motion and the right hand in a clockwise motion, something like this. I learned to play pretty much by ear, and what I could hear drummers doing on recordings when they played brushes was that they were playing smoothly. And a ballad should be smooth. A ballad should be pretty. You know, you, you really should understand what the emotion of the song is about. And I think brushes allow you to play smooth, to play pretty, and to play elegantly. So, let's take advantage of what a brush can do, and a brush allows us to play legato on the snare drum. Using the DCI Skycam, we can get a nice overhead shot of the snare drum here. And let's imagine that the drum head is the face of a clock. 12 o'clock being here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. I position my left hand brush around seven and eight o'clock and it'll do this counterclockwise rotation there. The right hand is up around one and two o'clock. It does its clockwise rotation there. I rotate the brushes one revolution per pulse. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And notice that I'm using my entire forearm the elbow's real loose, and I'm rotating the brush by moving the entire part of the arm. In other words, I'm not rotating my wrist. Rotating the wrist like that changes the brush to head attitude. I want to keep it the same. One, two, three, four. I'm at the top of the revolution or the circle on each count or pulse. All right, I add the right hand, it can do the same thing. One, two, three. Now, that sounds pretty smooth, but it's not really rhythmic. So, while the left hand has given us a good cushion or a pad, the right hand can articulate the rhythm. I do that by lifting up the brush on each revolution and bringing it down on every pulse. One, two, three, one, two. If I leave the brush on the head a little bit longer and then snap it around, I change the articulation. One, two. I now have a smooth and rhythmic beat. One, two. That's my basic brush beat. Now I'll start moving the brushes around on the drum head. It changes up the texture feels kind of good to do it, sort of like stirring up the soup or the salad. And uh, the right and left hand are still keeping the same clockwise and counterclockwise motion. But I get into a little bit of over and under figure eight kind of a pattern between the two hands. Three, four, Now, while I'm doing a lot of my rhythmic articulation with the right brush, practice rhythmic articulations with both the right and left hand. Now, in playing a ballad, 
like I said before, you want to play pretty. You want to respect the mood of the piece, kind of get a feeling for the emotion. And a common thing at the same time in jazz ballads, uh, when you get to the bridge, is to play some sort of a double time. A more subtle effect is the quasi-double time or inferred double time. So when you get to that section of the tune, you don't need to go full tilt double time. One, two, three. You're going from a, a nice slow triplet mood to this double time. Well, maybe play the double time on, on, just the, uh, on just the snare drum with the brushes and keep the hi-hat in the original slow meter, for example. One, two, three, four, two, three. Okay, here we go. Or we can double time the hi-hat and keep the brushes in the original triplet feel. Either way, especially when you're playing the slower part of the tune, you know, be aware of, of the mood of the piece. And if, if it's a slow triplet feel, then, for goodness sake, don't do this. Something wrong with this picture. Do not adjust your TV set. It's only in the drummer's interpretation. So, it's a slow triplet, keep that mood. If you're gonna play double time, then if you mean it, great.
Duke Ellington once said that it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And music has to feel good, of course, and jazz music has to swing. But I think one of the greatest things about jazz music is improvisation. Improvisation is instant composition. This opportunity for us to improvise is the greatest thing that jazz offers us as musicians and certainly as drummers. We can improvise all the time that we're playing. Uh, Joe Zolvano gave me my greatest lesson when he said, always compose when you play. So I don't just want to play the same things over and over again and just play what I know. I want to create something new. And, and build on what I know. So, uh, to do that, then I want to make sure that I don't just keep repeating myself by playing what my hands know. You know, I've got a brain and I've got an imagination and you've got some heart. We want to put all that into our music making. Now, very often, instrumental players, uh, they learn their scales, they learn their licks, and they can use these in, in any number of, of situations. John Abercrombie has a great way of, of, of teaching improvisation. And this is to restrict the choice of, of notes. Uh, in this sense, he uses a rhythmic restriction of, of using only half notes on a, on a standard tune, like all the things you are. And instead of being able to play licks, he has to pick every note. Every note has to be a well-chosen note. He's composing. Okay? So, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. We can do the same thing on the drum set. Restrict ourselves to a choice of notes. Maybe start with eighth notes. Play them on or off the beat. Add triplets on or off the beat. Sixteenth notes, start combining them and then put in a little bit of phrasing to, to really make the music uh, uh, sound like you. And then you have something interesting to listen to. And it's much more interesting to play. Now I would like to improvise on the drum set to the accompaniment of a drum machine. And I'll demonstrate uh, these ideas of starting with simple rhythmic elements, eighth notes on and off the beat, sixteenth notes, etc., and build it into some music. Hope you like it.
Well, what I look for in a drummer is, uh, first of all, someone, someone who makes the music feel basically comfortable. Someone who has uh, a sense of space when they play. Another way I would term it is elasticity. Someone who plays with a very elastic, expansive type of a beat so that I can weave my lines and my rhythms through his, his fabric, so to speak, and, and play off each other. Someone who has a good sense of, of interplay. Not only rhythmic interplay, but someone who hears melodies and also is sensitive to harmonic shifts in the music. And also sound, the sound of Pete's drums, the cymbals, the whole kit, blends well with my sound. And I think a lot of playing in a situation, a small group like this, uh, a lot of it is the sonic interplay, what the cymbal sounds like with, the, with this register of the guitar, or how the toms are interacting with the, the guitar timbre. It's a timbral kind of a thing. Rhythm section functions differently in a trio. There's more space, more room to uh, let your ideas out and, and maybe play more obscurely. Whereas in a larger ensemble, you need to be taking care of business more so, so everyone knows where the downbeats are falling and uh, where the <clears throat> signposts are in the forms.
enjoyed spending this time with you and I hope you've enjoyed it too. In volume two of this video series we're going to explore some different kind of rhythmic possibilities, some ethnic beats, a lot of Latin and funk stuff. The trio is going to do more playing and uh, we'll also look into some open kinds of music. I hope I see you all soon. Thank you. 